Perfect. Uh, so now, uh, finally, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. The Honorable uh, Roosevelt Skerritt, the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. And without wasting uh, any more time, I'm, uh, apologies, uh, Prime Minister, you are not showing on a list of panelists and that's the reason we had to interrupt. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, and I thank all our attendees and the participants for today's webinar for the patience as well. And without wasting any more time, Alan, uh, request you to take over. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you for being with us uh, this this morning. And uh, we um, we uh, we welcome all our other panelists. Uh, I'll, I'll get straight to the questions, Prime Minister. Um, at the outset, let me let me congratulate you on 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 the good job done. How you've contained uh, the pandemic in 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 the, in the Commonwealth of uh, Dominica. Uh, I, I heard that for 46 days you have zero active cases and, and the country is slowly opening up. Do you think in the new normal, um, would, would, would there be a greater interest in investment in Dominica, particularly via the CBI program? First of all, I want to thank you for having me on and I want to greet your other panelists and of course uh, those in attendance. Uh, our suppression of COVID-19 um, cases really has shown the community spirit of the people of Dominica. Uh, we came together uh, as one nation, one people, uh, to fight this invisible enemy. And, and I believe that the strength of the Dominican people and the resilience of the Dominican people uh, and the clear indication of a united country all would be attractive to um, the to, to the, to the um, in prospective investors. But it also shows and demonstrates the, the robustness and effectiveness of our health system. Uh, in our case in Dominica, we have prided ourselves on our investments in our health system, not only in the infrastructure, but, but with uh, equipment and also human resources. I will also say to you that after Hurricane Maria in 2017, our country was literally flattened. And normally in, uh, normally in circumstances after a natural disaster like Hurricane Maria, you would have had um, associated health issues um, coming about, whether it's waterborne diseases or other forms of diseases. Yeah. And we never saw this in Dominica because of the effectiveness and robustness of our health system. And for us, for every citizen of this world, 
um, health is important. And, and I believe in, in large measure, the, the containment of the spread of COVID-19 and the successful um, recovery of all those who were impacted um, really uh, are attractions to, to investors and prospective citizens alike. Could you, could you discuss a little more about uh, your housing revolution? I mean, you, you're making uh, climate resistant housing, how, how all, that, all that investment is going into good, good infrastructure, health. Could you, could you discuss uh, a little more about your housing revolution? So we, we launched a, a housing revolution in 2015, following um, a tropical storm which visited our country. And also subsequent to that in 2017 with the hurricane. And we gave a commitment to our citizens that if we were to be visited by a similar storm, uh, we will be in a better position to withstand the ravages of these natural disasters. You know, climate change is with us. Uh, we in small countries do not contribute to uh, the emission of greenhouse gases, but we are the major victims of climate change, if the effects of climate change. And so we made a commitment to build some 5,000 uh, resilient uh, hurricane-proof uh, homes. These homes that we are building are, um, can withstand the natural disasters, they can withstand um, storms, they can withstand hurricanes, they can withstand earthquakes. And the, these homes are being financed um, exclusively uh, with funds from the Citizens by Investment Program. And, and um, we have built um, several hundreds of those. Um, there are several hundreds currently under construction. And as a matter of fact, in the next few days, we'll be handing over keys to 225 of those homes uh, to deserving uh, families across the length and breadth of our country. Uh, and I am satisfied with what we have done so far. And I believe the citizens of Dominica are, are, are grateful for this. And of course, I, I believe it is a sense of of commitment and a sense of contribution from our investors who have invested in this, um, in, the, in the construction and the financing of those homes. Okay, uh, is are these funds also used for you know uh, for for roads for you know for um, you're you're looking at health at the health sector? How much of it is uh, would, would would this go to? I mean, it, it, or does it depend on the situation? Uh, how how do you allocate this? So we, we have a very transparent um, way of spending our CBI funds. Our CBI funds are reported to the parliament of our country. Um, and if you go to the parliament and you look at the, uh, the estimates, uh, budgetary estimates, you will see where we clearly um, indicate how these funds are being spent. Um, we have decided to use the CBI funds in a sustainable way. Okay. So we avoid using it for recurrent expenditure. We use it mainly for our public sector investment program, the building of schools, the building of hospitals, health centers, roads, bridges, um, the education of our, of, our, of our human resources, our children, our, our youth. And also we have used those funds uh, at some point to pay on our more expensive external debt. And, and so we have been able to reduce our, our national debt utilizing the CBI funds. So, so I believe in Dominica, we have a, a, a clear, um, way of using these funds. And I think without boasting, we can be a template uh, for, for, for many countries with um, CBI programs and, and as to how best to utilize those funds um, to, to create jobs, uh, to grow the economy, um, to reduce poverty, and to create a sustainable path for development in our country. That's one of the reasons why you, you consistently top uh, the CBI ratings. Uh, but but I, I'm talking of now sustainable uh, sustainable development and climate change. You you have you have been the victim, I would say, of, of of many hurricanes. How do you balance as a small nation, as a sustainable nation? How do you balance the two? Development as far as sustainability is concerned. Well, we as you know, we are the we are, we are the front line of the fight against climate change. Um, we we believe that climate change is real. And we have um, leave the, the the impact and implications of climate change, and and so what we're seeking to do with our development plans 
is to invest in sustainable projects that could help us withstand the effects of climate change. I'll give you a classic example of a project, and we're moving more towards renewable energy. And in the next uh, few years, we will be able to produce about 85% of our energy through natural means, uh, renewable means. And we have this major project, the geothermal project, which in large measure will, will be financed by the CBI, with CBI funds. Uh, and we will be able to provide, um, supply most of our energy with um, geothermal. But critically too, we will be able to export the excess energy uh, to the islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique, thereby uh, bringing in foreign exchange into our country, but also um, eliminating the use of fossil fuel in our country. And, and so we, we're seeking to, to, to balance this, the, this sustainable development vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change. The other thing too we're moving very um, speedily to is using more renewable um, materials. Um, for example, we were able to supply our citizens with over 70, over 100,000, sorry, um, renewable um, shopping bags, okay. moving away from the use of plastic bags. We have, we have banned styrofoam material okay. in our country, all in an effort to, to maintain um, our sustainable development agenda and also the protection of the environment and in, and, and in so doing, putting us in a better position uh, to deal with the effects of climate change. Thank you. Um, I'm talking of uh, your people, uh, startups, entrepreneurship. How are these funds being used to help Dominicans to, to, to build for themselves, to become entrepreneurs, to become startup, uh, uh, you know, startup businessmen? How, how are these funds? What has been the response? Been, have, you, have you been able to you create a startup culture, an entrepreneurship culture in your country? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, certainly, we have been able to do so. Um, we have been able to provide both grants and highly concessionary loans to um, budding and aspiring entrepreneurs in our country and even existing ones. Um, you could come to our development bank as a citizen mm -hmm. and uh, contract a loan at 1% interest I read that. Um, and, and sometimes even at 0% interest, utilizing the CBI funds to help create this entrepreneurship culture in our country. And so, so, so doing create jobs among our people and reduce poverty. And even at a, at a higher level with regards to the investments, the, the projects and the developments with the CBI funds, a number of the developers are in fact Dominican citizens. A, a case in point with regards to Tranquility Beach, uh, Mr. Ian Edwards, he's a Dominican. We have also um, the Anachi, uh, which is um, branded by Marriott, a, a local Dominican, Mr. Alec Lawrence. We also have um, the Secret Bay um, being developed on some 40 or so uh, villas, a local Dominican. We also have Jungle Bay with 200, 100 and and 60 um, um, villas, a, a local Dominican, uh, Mr. Sam Raphael. So we have been able to use these funds to empower our citizens, um, to, to, to create entrepreneurs, um, and to ensure that people can, our citizens can see the, and feel um, and benefit from the proceeds coming out of the CBI fund. Because what we would like to do, and what we are in fact doing, and we've seen the results, is for us to become independent. So we do not have to rely on, on, on external um, funding um, from agencies. We can use our, our, our resources um, to build our, our country in a manner in which we would like to build it and to empower people in a manner in which we, we believe we should be empowering our people. Personal question, Prime Minister. You, you took over in 2004 at, at 31 and you, you were, you were then the youngest prime minister. Everybody talks of young prime ministers. Well, back then, nobody noticed it, I guess. But then at 31, you were, you were prime minister, and, 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 and the country has come a long way. What do you think has been your major uh, successes as far as creating an, uh, an ecosystem for development in, in, these, in these years? And what, what have been your major successes? What do you consider your major successes? 
Well, I always say to my people that I am the least of the apostles. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I do not, um, I, I, I am not in a position to, to determine what my success is. I, I leave it to the people uh, to decide. But what I would say to you, my friend, and, and to our colleagues who are first here this, this evening, that, what, that, that there's a little, there's a little that can really make a, a prime minister um, proud and, and, as, and a Dominican uh, as proud as to see a nation rally um, after natural catastrophe of the scale of Hurricane Maria, um, which in a matter of hours damaged almost every building in our country, um, brought death and, and blocked access to our many natural resources. And even in your earlier question about fighting COVID-19, we have been successful largely because the people of Dominica have been united in our fight. They have adhered to the government's um, instructions and guidelines. Uh, I mean, our people have been on, on curfew and lockdown, and there has been absolutely no uh, issues whatsoever. They have been working with us in this fight. And so, despite it all, Dominica is growing and flourishing. Uh, we are promoting ecotourism, uh, improving sanitation, ensuring uh, disaster risk reduction. In, in other words, we are being proactive, uh, dynamic, and forward-looking. And, and uh, I, I dare say that these are some of the things which I am proud of as, as, as a prime minister of our country. You, uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll just veer a bit off. I mean, would would you say that you have dealt with so many disasters that you're more prepared for 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 a health pandemic like this? Is 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 it part of you 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 made more resilient? You're inherently resilient as a nation. Is, oh, yeah. Would you agree with that? Oh, oh yes, certainly. Um, we have been through for challenges, but Dominicans, we are resilient. Um, we don't. Uh, when we see a disaster, we don't go running. We <laughs> confront it. Um, and, and, and that's what we've been doing. Um, we, we spend time planning and preparing uh, for these things. And so it is a continuous exercise, um, ensuring that our, our systems are in place um, and, and our systems are robust. Our, our systems can, can stand the test of, of scrutiny. Um, and, and, and so we are accustomed to it. It, it is not something that we like to confront because we would rather not have to confront hurricanes and of course this pandemic, but we have no control over these things. And, and so the things which we have control over, we plan and prepare for them and we, and we take full control of them. And, and we bring the citizenry into our trust and confidence um, by, by informing them every single day of where we are, what we are doing, what we shall do tomorrow, and what is required of them as citizens of Dominica. And, and so we have experience. We have experience in, in, in fighting these, um, these, these natural disasters, and of course, this, um, this pandemic. I mean, you know, when, we, when you hear talk, for example, in the international community of the elderly being vulnerable and those with underlying um, health issues are vulnerable to COVID-19, we had an 85-year-old man mm. and an 84-year-old wife who were, who were both tested positive for COVID-19. The 85-year-old man and his wife are diabetic. They're hypotensive. Okay. And the, 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 the husband has a heart condition. And by the grace of God, he was, he was able to successfully recover from COVID-19. And, and, and again, it, it, it speaks to our preparedness. It speaks to our, the robustness of our systems. And, and our commitment to our citizens. Prime Minister, I'll, I'll just ask you another personal question. When, when you took over in 2004, would, when you looked, looked ahead, and what went on in your mind that day at 31? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, what what, what um, was going through your mind? Well, you know, uh, I am a, I, I'm a Christian, so I, I, I look to the mountain from whence my strength cometh. You know, um, okay. I... I I came in at the time when we were um, in, in the middle of an IMF austerity program. Okay. Um, and, and thank God we were able to successfully um, go through this program uh, with, with flying colors. Uh, you know, in life, you know, when you're placed in a position, 
it is not a time for you to dwell on the challenges, but look at the opportunities. And so we looked at the opportunities. We looked at the positive side of things. And we, we start to work towards achieving those goals. And if I dare say with the greatest sense of humility, I, I think we have come a long way um, since 2004, since I took over as prime minister of, of, of this beautiful country. I'll conclude with a, with a question. I mean, let's, let's talk about the nation's ambitions. Are you, would you say uh, you, the ambitions, what, what do you look at the future and do you, does it worry you after the pandemic? What are your ambitions? What do you aspire Dominica to become? Well, we, we after Hurricane Maria in 2017, when I addressed the United Nations about three or four days after this devastating hurricane, we declared to ourselves and to the international community that Dominica would become the world's first climate resilient nation. Okay. And, and I am satisfied that notwithstanding the challenges which we are confronting, we are well on our way uh, to achieving this feat. And resilient in terms of infrastructure, resilient in terms of the, our economy, our fiscal policies, our, our health system, our education system, and even our, our CBI program, our CBI program has demonstrated to the world that, that it, it is part of this resilient, uh, resilience agenda of the government. So we, we, we're really working towards uh, becoming a resilient nation. As I said, climate change is real. We, we believe in the science of climate change. We have lived the um, consequences of climate change. And while we have been um, calling and knocking at the doors of the developed world to change their, uh, their, their habits. We have decided what we can do by ourselves, for ourselves, we shall do it. And that is to build resilience in our country and, and to become a resilient nation. So when these storms do come, um, we are better able to one, withstand it, and two, recover um, much quicker from, from any impact which this storm would have had on our country. So our, our, our ambition is, is a very lofty one uh, for a small country, for a small population. Uh, but by we explaining and developing this vision, this ambition, I believe we have gotten the support of the international community and, and people are looking to Dominica. I mean, and I, and I say so with the greatest of humanity again, that anytime you speak about uh, building resilience, People will tell you, uh, look to the look to the Commonwealth of Dominica, and 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 see what they're doing in housing, see what they're doing with the health system, see what they're doing with the fiscal policies, uh, see what they're doing with their education systems. I mean, we have been hit by this COVID-19, by these um, hurricanes, and in, in all of this, we have never defaulted on our debt payments, for example. Um, we have never defaulted on our commitments to our young people to educating them. So there are certain um, core values which we um, espouse and which we remain true to. I mean, even with regards to the CBI program, um, we have won the accolades of, of many international uh, publications. And we believe that uh, we have been able to do so because of three, three critical um, elements, the quality of our program, the efficiency of our program, and our robust due diligence. And we have, we have uh, strong experts within the CBI unit. We also provided with great guidance from CS Global, who is our marketing agent, uh, in ensuring that our, 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 the quality of our program is maintained. Efficiency, you apply to Dominica program today, my friend. We give you the assurance um, that we can have a three-month turnaround um, time with um, giving you approval in principle. And of course, due diligence is critical because we are part of international community. And we don't only have an obligation to ourselves as Dominican citizens, but we have an obligation to the international community. And we want to ensure that when somebody applies to our program, that, that we can know the moral fabric or the moral character of, of each applicant to ensure that those who um, we provide our citizenship with and who we call family and, and fellow citizens um, can, can stand the test of scrutiny 
by any international agency or any, in any country in this global hemisphere. I have one more question regarding UAE ties. Uh, you, you were here in January to open your, uh, your embassy in the UAE. I was talking to, to Ambassador Hubert a little earlier. Uh, and and I, I, was, I, I was wondering how the UAE can, can help you in, in, in what, what are you partnering with the UAE with uh, regarding, would it be aviation, would it be ports, would you be working together? How, how does it, uh, what are your future plans with the UAE? I, I think, I, I, I dare say we have, we have excellent, excellent relations with the UAE. And the setting up of, or the establishment of our embassy in Abu Dhabi is, 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 is testament to this. And we have been able to sign a number of cooperation agreements with the government of the UAE um, in renewable energy, um, sustainable development, um, education and training. Um, we are getting technical advice from them in respect to port development. They have tremendous experiences in this. Uh, we're looking at, um, at tourism. Uh, how can we learn from them? How can they learn from us? Um, and, and, and so on. We have also been um, very supportive of the UAE um, on the international scene. And, and so the relationship between Dominica and the UAE is, is, is excellent. It's very, very, very good um, relations. And what we're seeking to do now is to deepen those relations and to strengthen those relations. And our ambassador, His Excellency Hugo Charles, is, is doing a fantastic job there, um, if, I, if, I must, if I may say so. And we have, since the establishment of the embassy, we have seen uh, an even closer collaboration uh, between Dominica and the UAE. As a matter of fact, Dominica is seen in large measure as um, UAE's um, connection to the Caribbean community um, CARICOM, and, and we are very happy to play that role um, on, on the behalf. Are there flights, uh, are you planning on more flights to connect to Dominica? You have an airport. Uh, I'm sure there can't be direct flights, but would there be, would there be some kind of an aviation agreement where it's easier to get to Dominica from the UAE? Is, 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 would, you, would you consider that in the future? Well, we, we're working, I, I must say to you that we're working on our international airport. Um, we We are finalizing plans for this. Obviously, we, we, we got a little setback with COVID-19, but we're very keen on this. Um, at the broader CARICOM level, we are in discussions with the UAE on the issue of direct flights between the UAE and the Caribbean. Uh, we're hoping that those discussions can continue because, as you know much better than me, the UAE is a, is a major international hub. And, and, and I think um, many of us uh, across the globe can benefit um, from establishing um, um, aviation agreements uh, with the United Arab Emirates. I have two questions. Thank you, Prime Minister. I have two questions for His Excellency Hubert Jones. Uh, I'll, it's specifically to uh, related again to the UAE, and I'll just I'll, I'll just uh, quickly sum it, summarize it. Um, have you noticed, uh, um, uh, His Excellency Jones? Have you noticed uh, um, more tourism uh, interest from the UAE to to, uh, to Dominica. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, before I answer it, let me greet the Honorable Prime Minister and my brother and friend, Ambassador Nanton. Even though we are on the same panel, we are miles and miles apart. <laughs> It's good to share an activity with you at this time. Um, the The relationship with the UAE, as the Prime Minister has indicated, is a strategic one. The intention is to utilize the experience of a country that many would agree is one of the most dynamic and progressive countries uh, in the world, uh, small states in the world, and to utilize the excellent experience of, those con of the, this country. Uh, and seek to determine the extent to which they can be applied to our own development challenges. I think it is important for us to, to, begin, to begin with that. Um, no, I don't think it is uh, as yet very evident that we have a large flow of uh, nationals 
either UAE nationals or Dominican res uh, nationals resident in the UAE to, to Dominica. Th this is the plan, this is the vision. I, I, I am actually excited uh, to, to be able to tell you that, that there have been uh, a, a few uh, Dominicans who on the basis of discussion um, with us, with the embassy, have actually gone down to Dominica uh, to, to get to know the country and to explore opportunities for investment. I think it is important for us to, to begin there. Uh, nationals need to move into phase two. Phase one is the acquisition of one of the best citizenship and packages in the world. Phase two is getting to know the country so that uh, a different relationship, a citizen relationship um, can be developed. And I think until that happens, until there is greater demand from our citizens um, and others, but primarily our citizens resident here for uh, travel opportunities to Dominica, um, we, we, we're probably not going to see the, 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 the type of flow, uh, either in tourism or in investment that we would like to, to, to see. Um, the, the point made by the Prime Minister regarding the international airport, I think, is an excellent um, one to, to remind ourselves of. Um, until that facility is available, uh, the, the, the tourism program should be pursued and will be pursued through a regional uh, arrangement. Don't forget that uh, the last uh, uh, CARICOM uh, UAE forum that was held here, I think in, in, 20, in, 19, in 2018, um, one of the key topics was the question of tourism and air linkages between the UAE um, and, and our region. And there's an agreement that that will be a priority going forward. What, what are the services that are available to Dominican citizens here in the UAE? What does the embassy do? Well, Currently. our consular section is already active in terms of uh, renewing passports. Okay. Uh, quite a few of our citizens need to validate uh, official documents, uh, documents coming out of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and sometimes from other, other, uh, other sources. So one of our key responsibilities is to, is to validate, uh, having verified, of course, those, those, agreement, those um, documents. We also hope to do a little more in terms of uh, utilizing the excellent experience of our first secretary to organize uh, some visits structured visits between Dominica and the, and the uh, UAE. So already the consular section is quite busy um, and we are quite pleased with what we have been able to do up to now. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Prime Minister. I will leave the floor to, to Abhinav who will, who will take forward a few more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, Dr. The Honorable uh, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt, uh, especially because it's early in the morning over there and he's been very kind enough to uh, grace us with his presence. I would also like to um, thank and ask His Excellency Hubert John Charles to uh, please hold on as uh, we have our other two panelists, uh, Ambassador Emmanuel Lanton and uh, Beatrice Gatti uh, from the CS Global Partners, joining us for a couple of questions in terms of a panel. And I would like to start our first question with Ambassador Emmanuel, that uh, one of these distinguishing factors for MENA applicants is family size. As many uh, MENA investors uh, choose to include not just spouses and children in the application, but also parents and grandparents. Now, what are the requirements for these dependents, uh, Ambassador Emmanuel? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to you and to, to the, those who joined us. It's my pleasure being with you. And uh, of course, it's always good to discuss our program. You know, we have uh, ranked very highly as a global program. And uh, that's mainly because of our partners, the stakeholders who work with us, the agents who, who direct them, and uh, who, who get satisfaction time and time again before our unit. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time off to be with us. Really and truly, uh, when we look at, at uh, the requirements for becoming or, or dependents of a main applicant, uh, a male applicant could include uh, one spouse. Uh, he would include, uh, he or she would include 
any number of children that he or she has that's under 18. Children who are 18 to 30 years old and who are in full-time attendance at an institution of higher learning are also uh, included, can be included, I would qualify. They must be fully supported by the main applicant as well. If there are, are, are any unmarried daughters of the main applicant, uh, once they're under 30 and they're living with the main applicant and uh, they're dependent on the main applicant, they too would qualify. Uh, for a main applicant, including to your parents, uh, grandparents, once they are uh, age 55 years of old or older, and then uh, you could include the spouse of a qualifying parent or grandparent. So really and truly, we allow uh, a single applicant to be able to add on a number of families because for us, the family unit is part of who we are. Uh, uh, it, it, it defines uh, us as a people and as Dominicans. So you could add your, your children, they're under 18. You could add your spouse, you could add your parents, if you have children who are between 18 and 30 at the Institute of Higher Learning, they can be added as well. You could add your grandparents and the spouse of, of your qualifying uh, grandparent as well. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. And I would like to uh, move to uh, His Excellency Hubert John Charles with the second question. Uh, your Excellency, uh, in your role as ambassador to the UAE, uh, do you engage with prospective Dominican citizens? What are the main questions uh, with regard to Dominican citizenship that you face from them? Yes, so the answer is, is yes. The engagement is ongoing. We need to allow, though, for the, the fact that the primary responsibility to, to treat with the prospective um, uh, citizen is that of the agent. And we, we try not to, not to intrude on that. But we are very anxious to, to support the agents whenever um, the, the, the request support from the embassy. Uh, the Prime Minister earlier mentioned um, Mr. Ian Edwards. Um, he, he actually invited the ambassador to, to, to accompany him on a, a familiarization and promotional mission. Um, the questions that prospective citizens usually ask me have to do with the speed with which the application can be processed. And we are always pleased to say that within three months, you are, you are very likely, uh, if you meet all the due diligence requirements, uh, to, to, to have a, a successful outcome. Um, people are also wanting to understand the whole question of due diligence. Um, and, and at times, it is necessary to, to, to say to them, that even though the due diligence is, is very rigorous, it is ultimately in their own interest. Because once they pass that, that stage, they can present themselves. Um, but we are pleased with what is happening. I suspect that with, with, with COVID, we are entering into a new phase. Um, but I think we will continue, as the Prime Minister indicated, um, we, we do have a country with a mix of assets uh, that are much more than simply a question of uh, a travel document. Um, and we have the, the prospects with the, 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 the passion for the future, the concern for citizens, uh, a, a strong political culture uh, that, that has to do with, with tolerance, um, human rights, democracy. Those, I think, are the factors that are going to be important in terms of decisions regarding uh, where you invest your, your, your scarce resources for, for um, citizenship in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to bring in uh, Beatrice uh, from the CS Global Partners right now, who heads the uh, uh, government advisory uh, practice over there. Uh, Beatrice, the question, the first question for you is, I think uh, this is a question that everyone would like to uh, know, uh, get the answer for, that what makes the Commonwealth of Dominica model of economic citizenship so successful? I mean, you have a lot of other programs by other countries, but what is it that makes the program by the Commonwealth of Dominica so successful? Thank you for that question. Firstly, just let me say that it's a pleasure to be on a panel um, with um, such important guests, and it's great to be here and to be speaking with you. Um, Ambassador Nantha, and it's a pleasure to see you. Ambassador Charles, thank you for being here. Um, so let me, let me answer your question. I think there are 
three things that make Dominica's program a success. The first one is simplicity. Um, you have a two investment structure. One is a contribution. One is a purchase of real estate. Uh, you have authorized agents that are there to help you, to walk you through the process. And you have a unit that is incredibly communicative. I mean, Ambassador Nathan is here today. You go on the website and you have a list of the documents you need. It's all there for you. And this is an incredible asset. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is efficiency. It has been mentioned before. Um, three months is fantastic amount of time to be looking at if you want to obtain citizenship. And from the moment of submission to approval in principle, you are looking at those three months. So that's obviously very appealing. And now my third point, I think, is um, certainty. Now, the Dominica program has been established for decades. And this means to an investor, they look at Dominica and they think, wow, um, I know that if I apply through this program, I will indeed get citizenship. I perhaps know someone who went through the program and has obtained citizenship. And investors do like to have confidence in the fact that they will get a return on their investment. And Dominica can give that confidence. Thank you so much for that, uh, Beatrice. I would like to bring in Ambassador Emmanuel once again uh, in this discussion. Uh, Ambassador, the next question is for you. That uh, We know that there are two investment options available under the Citizenship by Investment Program, a contribution to the government, commonly known as the EDF contribution, and an investment in real estate. Now, what is the difference between uh, these two options? Well, the EDF option is really is a one-time non-refundable contribution to the government. And uh, it does not require any follow-up activity uh, or the payment of any government fees uh, from that. The real estate option is an investment with a third party in government. And that, that must be done in an approved development project by the government. It must be held for three to, uh, to five years. If you sell it after three years, then uh, the person who, who buys from you or purchases from you will not be able to, uh, will not qualify for citizenship. But if you hold that, that investment for five years, anyone uh, purchasing after, after five years, after thorough due diligence, if they pass the due diligence, he or she would qualify to be a citizen of Dominica as well. So the only payment uh, that's received by the government for, for that uh, investment option would be government fees. So really and truly, there's the EDF, which is a direct contribution to government, and there's real estate, which is an investment in a private real estate program once that has been approved by the government of Dominica. Thank you so much for that. I would like to uh, bring in uh, Beatrice over here in the conversation again. I think this is a question a lot of people would have, uh, Beatrice. Is, that is, do you think the post-COVID-19 era is the right time for high net worth individuals and professionals to consider a second citizenship? Do you think uh, is the right time for them? So let me just highlight that CS Global Partners has been saying since forever that uh, considering a second citizenship is a fantastic idea and should be done at all times. Now, having said that, uh, and sort of turning to COVID-19 again, um, I think what COVID-19 has done is probably highlighted certain priorities that were not so clear before. So I think people probably think a little bit more about healthcare. Um, people probably think a little bit more about how important it is that the place they call home is beautiful and safe. Um, they probably want to think a little bit more about the community that surrounds them. And of course, Dominica ticks all these boxes so well. Um, as the Prime Minister mentioned, you know, they have a very robust healthcare system. Certainly their sense of community is incredibly strong, incredibly resilient. Um, and I, I doubt there's very many places in this world that are as beautiful as, um, as Dominica and Nature Island in the Caribbean. Um, but I think it's also important because of COVID-19, I, I, I don't want people to be put off uh, from the idea of applying. And in fact, uh, I mean, Ambassador Nathan knows this far better than I do, but the, the unit is operational. Um, it has the ability to work remotely because they have some uh, case management system, online case management system, um, and, and all the other relevant offices are active. And this is incredibly uh, reassuring to, to prospective investors. So uh, thank you for that. I think a couple of people had asked this question offline as well. So I think it gives answers uh, this for them and they would be able to take the discussion forward uh, after the web. Now, uh, I would like to once again, uh, direct this question to uh, Amb Ambassador Nantin, that uh, Ambassador, how many government approved real estate options are there? And what does the government look for before approving a project? 
Well, there are seven government, uh, there are seven real estate programs approved by the government at present. There are three uh, well-known names in, in terms of international, uh, international uh, stature. You have the Anichi Resort that's been built uh, by Marriott, one of the, world, the world's largest hotel chain. Kempinski Europe's or largest chain is also a uh, building in Dominica, or uh, that has been sold out, but they are, they are building and they're open now in Dominica. And then uh, you have Tranquility Beach, uh, which has been built under the Hilton brand. So these are three well-known international names that are here uh, in Dominica under the program. But we also have a number of uh, local boutique hotel resorts that, that have been built. So you have the residence at Secret Bay, for instance, that's been built. And that is a very high-end, luxurious uh, eco resort being built here in Dominica. You have the Jungle Bay, which is also a well-known local resort as well. And they have won a number of old accolades as well. They have already opened and uh, they're still continuing to expand. So that's been done. And we have the Rainforest Eco Resort has been built out, out uh, in the rainforest, out in the Trafalgar area. And then we have Wakotlet, which has been built in the southern part of Dominica. So there are seven projects right now being constructed in Dominica. And I must say that they are all going on very, very well. In terms of uh, what it takes to qualify to be a, to be a government pro uh, project approved, then really and truly, you have to be working within the plans of the government of Dominica. So it must be a sustainable uh, project. It must be eco-friendly. We're building the world's first climate uh, resilient nation, and therefore uh, climate resilience is part of what, what, what uh, we look for when we, when we investigate or when we look at a project. It must be of widespread benefit to Dominican to Dominicans. Uh, the quality of rooms uh, have to be important. So I mentioned the results that we're building. We're building um, five five-star resorts. The Caribbean is, is uh, the one, one of, if not the world's leading tourism destination. And uh, Dominica is building more five-star resorts than anywhere else. That's where we pitch our island. That's how, where we see our island and, how, and where we are moving towards. So you must be able to fit in within, uh, within those, those type, type of things. The quality of rooms that you offer, uh, the benefits of job creation for, for uh, our people, uh, markets for our farmers, uh, etc. You must be able to fit in. There must be a product, a project that is sustainable, one that is eco-friendly, one that's been built with high standards and, and high level, and it, it must be uh, able to fit in with government overall view uh, of where we're taking our country as the world's only climate resilient nation or the world's first climate resilient nation. Uh, thank you so much for that, Your Excellency. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, I have the next question is for you as well. That uh, whether a, a, a MENA family, when we say MENA, it's Middle East and North Africa family, chooses the fund route or the real estate route, what costs would the family face? Now, let's take, for example, a family of six composed of a father, a mother, two children under 18, and the main applicants, two parents, and a single applicant. Now, what are the costs that these family would face? For such a family, really, if you take the EDF option, it would be $250,000. Then you, of course, if you have, have a family of six, you, on the EDF, it would be $250,000. If you take the real estate option, that would be uh, $200,000 plus $50,000 government fees. Neither the country to the EDF or the real estate investments are uh, at you. So in fact, we allow, we allow, uh, we accept the monies for due diligence and processing fees upfront. After, after you, uh, we have been vetted and given approval in principle, that is when we, we allow you to send your monies to Dominica or we allow you to pay. So really and truly, we let you know that you could apply, but unless we are confident that on, in who you are, we have done thorough checks on you, we will not accept your monies for investment, either for real estate or for, uh, for um, EDF fund. For due diligence, the main applicant would pay $77,500. And for, for, for uh, real estate, it, it, it would be the same thing. For any child who is above 16 years, there will be a further charge of $4,000 per applicant who is a per, per dependent who is above 16 years of age. And then for the file, is a $1,000 processing fee for the, for the child for a file, respective of the size or the number of applicants of people in that, in that file. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, I think that gives uh, quite a lot of clarity on uh, what is the charges that the, uh, these applicants would have to face. And I would move with this to uh, His Excellency Amb Ambassador Hubert John Charles uh, for the next question. Now, uh, 
uh, your excellency uh, i would like to ask you that do you know of uh, success stories of individuals who have completed the citizenship by investment process and had a positive impact on either the uae or dominica by virtue of the new citizenship not yet in terms of the individual um but i think where we need to focus is on the top the total the total package the the the, the combination of all those individual investors that we have been speaking about this morning has created a, a capacity um, that has been transformative um, in, in agriculture, in, in housing, uh, in education, almost in health. Uh, the CBI program, I think it is fair to say, has been a Dominica success story. Yeah. Uh, and that virtually every area that has been focused on has been has been has seen significant transformation. Um, the reference was just made to the to the, the hotel sector. Uh, just look at the speed with which the sector has been transformed, and not just the speed but the quality uh, level of the facilities. Um, this has been remarkable. There is really no question about it. Um, and and so and so. We simply need to continue to make sure that the, the, the program continues to be continues to be successful and continues to evolve. I think uh, uh, with this question, we would also like to uh, bring Beatrice back in the conversation. I think she's been missing in action. So uh, Beatrice, the next question is for you. Uh, uh, in what ways does the Dominica CBI program attract individuals from the Middle East? And what is the response that you have seen? I believe this question would be uh, very important for the prospective applicants as well. So what is, uh, uh, in what way does it attract and what is the response that you have seen? So I think there, there's a few things that I can mention here. Uh, the first one being that Dominique is a very fr family friendly um, jurisdiction. Uh, so you can add a lot of dependents um, to, to your application. So for example, parents, grandparents, um, and indeed children to the age of 30. Um, so that's obviously um, very interesting to people who have very large families, as is often the case for families in the Middle East. Um, of course, it's, th there's good value attached to, to, um, to Dominican citizenship. Um, you know, Ambassador Nanthan uh, said it very clearly earlier when, when you know, he mentioned single applicant need, needs to make a contribution of 100,000 um, to the EDF, or uh, it's 200,000 for real estate. Um, plus government fees. So these thresholds uh, remain attractive. Um, and I think uh, perhaps with respect to processing, we've already mentioned the speed of processing, but it's also important to mention some other things like the fact that you don't have to travel to Dominica um, to, to complete your application. You don't have to reside there if you don't want to. Um, I'm certain everyone here would recommend that you go there because it's wonderful, um, but you don't have to. Um, and, um, and you don't have to pass a language test. And that's important if English isn't your first language and you might be very anxious about that. Right. Uh, you also don't have to pass any um, interview un uh, unless an, it, there's a very extraordinary case. Um, but, but generally this is not a requirement. So again, if you're uncomfortable with that kind of interaction, you don't have to face that. And, um, and that is something that makes Dominica quite attractive. And I think uh, the second part of your question, um, if I recall correctly, was um, sort of what sort of patterns we've seen. And I, I can't speak response, for the government. Yes. yes, the response. So I can't speak for the government, of course, um, but I can speak for CS Global Partners. And certainly there has been uh, an increase in interest on the part of um, the Middle East. Uh, it's a continuous increase and we're very happy with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, mentioning that. Uh, we would like to move uh, once again to uh, Ambassador Nanthan. Uh, Ambassador, the next question is for you. And the question is that one of the main attractions of the uh, Dominica CBI program is its ease of processing, like Beatrice was just mentioning. Now, something that is often cited as one of the main reasons for Dominica achieving top scores on the CBI index, an annual publication by the Financial Times, PW Magazine. Now, what makes the program so straightforward, uh, so straightforward for applicants? Well, I think uh, we have been doing, doing well, and uh, we are pleased with where we are. But really and truly, we have been assisted tremendously by our agents. So uh, we, are, we require that every applicant must submit to a highly experienced authorized agents. 
and they know the things that we expect. So they, they guide very well our, uh, our investors and then they get uh, the process going through. They help us through uh, carrying out to go all over the, the bumps. So we really ensure our agents assist us very, very much. And then we are very pleased for that. Uh, in Dominica, we have, have our portal system where our agents up, uh, upload any and every file on the portal. So we can access that immediately wherever we are in the world. So uh, I think we have the best portal uh, in the, in the uh, immigration industry and that assists us to do our work from anywhere at any time. And we're very pleased to have that as well. We have also uh, have no travel is required to Dominica. So you don't have to travel and you don't have to be resident in Dominica. And that for us too uh, is important. There is no language uh, requirement. So you don't have to speak English to, to apply or to qualify. And then there's also no longer, there's no mandatory interview of all applicants. Once we assess who the applicant is, look, go through the file, then uh, we're able to go through, make our assessment. And if we need to ask you more questions, we will. If we need to send back information, uh, to get more information, we will, we will ask those information, send it back to due diligence uh, and move forward. We're also able to, uh, to upgrade and to upload our, our website on a continuous basis. So that for us have been the key factors that keep us flowing. The staff are highly trained, the staff are highly confidential, the staff are, are highly motivated, and they're eager to work and to, to deliver. We treat every investor as a VIP client. And once you upload on our portal, your name is assigned to somebody in the office who will follow your file and ensure that it's done within the time it should be done. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, that, Ambassador Nantan. I think the next question is uh, uh, for you as well. Uh, now, how do you balance the straightforwardness of the applicant for the applicant? the rigorous due diligence Dominica is known for? Well, really and truly, due diligence for us is the cornerstone of our program. There are no shortcuts. There are no ways to go among it. We must do thorough due diligence for everyone. For the applicant, this means extensive disclosure of family and business affairs, as well as the source of funds. By our forms and supporting documents, they must be provided to us at all times. However, the bulk of the due diligence process takes place away from the applicant such that the burden of is, this, is placed on the government and partners entities. They, we have for, uh, a 40 year due diligence process where our agents must know their client. They must also submit for us uh, a, a world check on, a, on, a, on every applicant. There must be an internal review by the unit staff. And I mentioned before that those are highly trained. They are trained in anti-money laundering uh, and, and other such fields. There is a mandatory due diligence, and we use the best firms in the world to go on the ground, boots on the ground, do enhanced due diligence for us on every applicant. They go to the place uh, where you live, where you work, the schools that, that you have been to. Uh, they find out from your colleagues and people in the industry where you operate, what is your reputation uh, in that industry. So those for us are, are important. They will give us pictures of your homes, of your offices, etc. They are really and truly very, very thorough. We have to know who you are, we have to get your bank statements and go through them to ensure to look at or we can substantiate the funds in and out based on what you disclose. So if there's something in there that uh, needs, ex needs ex explaining, upfront you should give us the information because the due diligence will find out and then we will need to know what is behind X, Y, um, or Z. We also use uh, regional, sorry, international intelligence. That is uh, for us, we use our GRCC. We work with bodies such as uh, Interpol, and the, the, the other major uh, government intelligence units. So that for us too is also, also important. Again, the cornerstone of our program, why we have been able to exist and, and do so well for 27 years is because for us, due diligence, knowing who we accept and who, and who we qualify is very, very important. Uh, I think the, what you mentioned is absolutely right and thank you for that. And, uh, Taking a cue out, out of that question, I would like to bring in His Excellency uh, Hubert John Charles uh, into the conversation. Your Excellency, the next, conversation, uh, the next question is for you, is that what do you think motivates individuals from developed countries to opt for Dominica's CBI program? Do you think the Dominica's track record of safety and security is an important factor over here? The, the, in the answer, I, I simply can repeat some of the information provided by Ambassador Nanton. Um, due diligence, I think, is, is one of the features that is best 
associated with the Dominica process. Um, by now, I think people know that you have to subject yourself to, 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 to the rigorous due diligence process. Um, but I, I hinted at a, the likelihood that people from developed countries and from developing countries as well would need to, and very likely after COVID-19, will be thinking of a little more than simply the convenience of travel that they can get through a Dominica um, instrument. Um, they, they will be looking at, at, at health, they will be looking at um, the quality of the environment, they will be looking at longevity. Um, the things that COVID suggests to us that, that we pay much more attention to, the quality of life, um, the ability to, to turn off, to, to, to escape for a little while into an environment that is healthy, but at the same time peaceful with progressive citizens. I think that progressively that is one of the things that people are going to pay much more attention to when they are deciding uh, on an investment option with regard to second citizenship. I think uh, uh, that's absolutely right what you've just mentioned. Now, uh, uh, I would just like to move once again to uh, Ambassador Nantan. Uh, Ambassador Nantan, the next question is for you. That, uh, like uh, His Excellency Hubert mentioned, you also mentioned in your previous, previous answer, uh, due diligence is a component of a much wider commitment to safety, integrity, and transparency. Now, in what other forms do safety, integrity, and transparency manifest themselves within the context of the CBI program? Well, for us in Dominica, uh, we, have, we exclude any applicant who have been denied a visa-free uh, visa to a country we have a visa-free access to. So if you apply uh, to the UK or, or, or Germany, uh, Europe, Schengen, uh, we would, we would de decline you on those because we have visa-free arrangements and we respect those. Dominica also excludes uh, certain nationalities where undergoing vetting becomes uh, difficult. So uh, North Korea uh, would be one, uh, Sudan and Iran would be difficult. Uh, we would not accept th those applicants. Unless if you're living and working out of those countries for, for a 10 year period, and you have no substantial assets uh, in those areas. So that uh, has to be, that was the terms in which we will accept an applicant from those countries. Of course, uh, integrity, transparency, the names of all those who receive CBI are published in our official gazette uh, in Dominica. So, so in Dominica, the citizens know who, the people who, 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 who qualified. The money received from the program is scrutinized by the director of audit, and those are reported to parliament on, on a, a regular basis. Uh, money received from CBI applicants, uh, how they are spent, they are itemized in our national budget. Third party auditing uh, is done. Recently, we had PricewaterhouseCoopers and Live uh, Coopers invited to Dominica, and they did an excellent review of Dominica on how the funds were utilized and spent. This has been a result of a detailed report, and that was published uh, in 2019. So really and truly, the Dominican populace are fully aware of what's happening. The Prime Minister spoke earlier of housing. We spoke uh, uh, of the investments that are taking place now in, in healthcare. Hospitals being built. There are 11 health centers being built uh, around the country. We have the Yes We Care program, where we take care of our elderly, but that's, that's been funded by uh, the citizenship program. We have the NEP, National Employment Program, where we have thousands of young people leaving school who are employed. So Dominicans, by and large, East, West, North, or South, are aware of what's happening, and they know the value and the contribution of CBI to Dominican to our country. Let me just congratulate the Prime Minister on a job well done in really and truly demonstrating how really to do it in terms of CBI. We go out, we expand on our program, we use the monies for the benefit of the people, and the people by and large uh, are satisfied with the quality housing that, we, that, that they're getting through our housing revolution, the quality health centers that's been built, the schools that have been built, uh, the roads, the young people that have been taken care of, uh, uh, as well as the elderly who we're taking care of. So really and truly, our program is transparent. Uh, the reports are there for all to see, and we publish the name of all our successful applicants. And I believe, uh, as Pricewaterhouse said in the report uh, last summer, Dominica is a model that all can follow up to. Absolutely. I think uh, a lot of us will agree to that point that you mentioned. And 
uh, which you reiterated with the PM uh, Prime Minister had mentioned earlier. Uh, now, Ambassador, we would like to move to the next question uh, from here. Uh, uh, now, CBI programs are increasing in number, as you know, right? With more and more nations implementing CBI legislation to attract investors. Are you concerned about these, uh, this increase in the number of CBI options available to foreign investors? Really and truly, uh, no. Uh, we're not concerned uh, of the number of countries doing CBI program. I believe uh, the industry is a good one. The industry has been there for a while. They expect the industry to grow. Dominica, uh, we have led, uh, led the world, the migration industry for, for the, the last number of years. We're hoping that once we can control and maintain the integrity uh, in the world industry, we'll be satisfied. Once we can maintain uh, our, our share, our market share, if the volumes increase, then we will increase. We do not subscribe or believe in tarnishing uh, other programs. We do not subscribe uh, or, or believe in uh, spreading dirty rumors um, in the program. Really and truly, too often, we have people in the industry tarnishing the industry. I believe at a time where we have COVID-19, introspection is where we should be. We should, we should be. Yeah. We believe that we should be looking at the mirror. As we look uh, at the, the industry post-COVID, we need to look at what can I do to make it better. We have gained the confidence of thousands of investors and have directed them to invest hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of dollars. They take our advice. I am sure they will take our advice on other things as well. So what else can we provide our investors with? Which other areas we can add to the industry? And uh, what we do and how we do it is not dependent on how we do to the name of somebody else or of another agent or of, or of another country, another program. Right now, yeah. as we're inside, I want to ask our agents, ask our professionals to look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. The program depends on the person you see in the mirror and what you can do to add to the industry. Let us stop the bickering, let us stop the fighting. Let us look at what else that I can do to make the industry better. And as the industry continues to grow, we will grow. Our, our volume will increase. Our revenue will increase. But it depends on how well we take care of each other. We must be each other's, uh, each other's keeper. I believe that is good from, from, from my view, from where we stand. That's how Dominica stands. That's, that's, how, that's our perspective on the migration industry at present. Uh, now, uh, Ambassador, we would like to... Uh because it is obviously the uh, webinar is for this program itself. The next question is again for you, is that uh, historically a key driver for CBI has been the added mobility that applicants obtain upon becoming citizens of Dominica. You're talking about the visa free uh, travel, right? How, how has Dominica increased its visa free and visa on arrival destinations? We have, we have visa free visa on arrival to 120 countries. Yes. We continue to improve and increase on that. We, as a, we added uh, Brazil, we added Russia. So we now we're up to 140 countries. Uh, for us, the value of our passport is important as Dominicans, no matter where you are. And uh, as we continue to lead the global migration industry, uh, having access for our citizens, uh, because by and large, the people who invest in the program are businessmen. And they want to be able to get up and take advantage of an opportunity uh, on the spot, on the spur of the moment. And that's what we do. We, we look at how we can improve and how we can uh, get more visa access to all our, for all our citizens, wherever they are. At present, I could let you know that we're looking at a number of other countries. And that although we start, stand at about 140 now, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be closer to 150 or, or beyond 150. So really and, and truly, we listen to our agents. They are the ones who direct us. They are the ones who tell us. Uh, they are the ones who are in touch with, with the, the investors, and they are the ones who tell us how the investors feel and what they are looking for. And once we listen, we try to be flexible we, by improving the quality of what we do, and not uh, once we don't have to compromise on our, on the integrity of our program. So we don't compromise at all. We look at how we, what we could do to improve and what we could do to enhance uh, the experience for our citizens, be the national born Dominicans or those who, who join through the, the program. And we continue to improve uh, in terms of visa-free access uh, right through. I think, uh, yes. Thank you so much for that. Uh, um, Ambassador Nantan, uh, the last question is also for you once again. And is the last question for today. 
uh, is do you have any upcoming plans to further improve the CBI program? And if so, what can we expect in the future? Our program uh, is geared at meeting the needs and demands of our investors. I mentioned before that we listen to our agents, we listen to, to uh, our investors, and we try to improve. So at, at present, we, we are offering uh, investments uh, in real estate, in world-class five-star hotels. They create jobs for our people, they create market for our farmers, our fishermen, our horticulturists. Uh, they create opportunities for our students living school. Yes, they do those things. Our vision is to ensure that we provide uh, more visa-free access, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier on. That is uh, important for us. The ambassador mentioned uh, other ID cards that our citizens are looking at. So we're looking uh, at those things as well. Uh, the world is moving more to biometrics. And we are, we are to, uh, at, at a point where we are about to implement a, a biometric passport. We are, we are, about, we are looking um, at new certificate of naturalization that have more security features uh, for them and in them. So really and truly, the ex we listen to our investors and we work within the laws. Uh, we ensure that we do not do anything that, that is going to affect the integrity of our program. So we're not interested in anybody look, who wants to look at money laundering. We are still interested to, to, to uh, the, the, the common reporting standards. So we look at the working along those lines. We, as a global partner, as somebody who is responsible in the global industry, we have a, we have a right to ensure that the people who are allowed in, into Dominica with, to use the Dominican passport are very are very good people. So that's why our due diligence uh, will, will we can never run away from that. Our due diligence must be top. It must be key. It's the cornerstone of our program. But we listen. We take advice from uh, our investors. We take advice from our partners. We take advice from those who are involved in the industry. And we try to ensure that we upkeep the name of the industry at, at any time. So that's where we are. That's who we are. We look forward uh, to uh, the world becoming COVID-free. Hopefully, that will be sooner rather than later. We look forward to uh, having some immunization or some form of, uh, of treatment to, to heal people who are infected with, with the COVID virus. So the world can continue to move. And we are sure that as the world continues to move, Dominica, Pro, Dominica and Dominica program will be an, uh, an example. Our Prime Minister did an excellent job uh, with his government and the Ministry of Health in ensuring that all those in Dominica who got infected were treated and, and went home. So Dominica now uh, is COVID free. We believe that we can sell a product that is a country that is naturally beautiful, a country where longevity, longevity is key, a country as naturally friendly, a country where five-star hotels are, are, are abundant for our visitors, a country where we live in peace and harmony with each other, where uh, we, the, the care for the elderly is key uh, for us, with a strong and solid healthcare system, a country that's naturally beautiful, a country where we are responsible for the environment, eco-friendliness, sustainability, these are uh, uh, some of the aspects that we aspire to. And these are, uh, that's where we see the world going to. I am proud to be Dominican. I am proud uh, to be part of the global community where we look to live in harmony with nature, to live in harmony with the environment, to live in harmony with, uh, with, with humankind all over. And we encourage people to come on to invest in Dominica. We encourage people uh, to join us, to visit our country. You will be pleased. You will be uh, blown away by the natural beauty, the friendliness of our people, the whale watching, the, our flora, our fauna, the houses that we're building for the people who could not afford. I believe really and truly in Dominica, we are a country, we are a nation, where we believe that taking care of your brothers and sisters is paramount to how you live. That is Dominica. That is the country where we're inviting people to invest in. And that's where we're inviting you, our partners, to come in, visit, and invest. Let us make this world a better place to live. Thank you, and have a good day wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Nantin. With this, uh, I would just like to add to what Ambassador Nantin said, that uh, with PwC confirming Dominica's superb standing and Dominica con uh, consistently gaining number one ranking by the PWM FTCBI ranking, the journey has been amazing and very, very well managed. So congratulations to you. Uh, congratulations to the Prime Minister. Congratulations to His Excellency Hubert John. And also congratulations to the partners, uh, such as the CS Global Partners and the team. So uh, yes, yes. thank you all for your time today. 
and especially for uh, Ambassador Nayanthan, I think most of us are here in the Middle East. Uh, I'm sure uh, we made you speak so much today, it must have made you a, a bit extra hungry in the morning. I had a few cups of coffee while we were going on, so I'll be <laughs> Wonderful. I, I wonder whether I can end by uh, just giving a shout out to the agents and the nationals who contributed to the establishment of the embassy in, 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 in Abu Dhabi. Um, we have a small but beautiful embassy, and it is thanks to even design elements were con con contributed by some of our nationals. We want, to, we want to let you know all the time that we are appreciative of this. And finally, those Dominicans with whom we have been speaking about the establishment of some mechanism for providing advice on investment going forward. We want to tell you that we are thankful for the work that you're doing already, and we look forward to a very dynamic relationship with you on investment going forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, I think, Beatrice, you're the only person uh, who's not given any last words. Any last words from you? Before yeah, I wasn't given any last questions. No, I just want to, again, reiterate how thankful I am to be on this panel. It's such an honor, and it's also, it's also great to just um, to listen to you uh, answer the questions uh, as, mu as much as one is in the industry. It's always fantastic to learn a little bit more each time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today. I would also like to thank the Prime Minister uh, for being with us so early in the morning. I know a lot of attendees have been trying to ask questions, but uh, it would not be fair uh, to just give the opportunity to a couple of them. Please be rest assured that the partners would be in touch with you after the webinar to answer all the questions that you have. With that, I would like to once again thank all the attendees, all the panelists, and of course, the, the Prime Minister uh, for being a part of this webinar. And uh, please wait as the partners get in touch with you. And in the meanwhile, are uh, hoping that everyone stays safe and is healthy. And uh, thank you so much once again. With that, I would like to end this webinar and have a good day, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Anton, all the best. All the best, your comrade. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.